Hello and welcome to another lecture of ECE 108. In this lecture we're going to talk about Bayes' theorem and then a bunch of examples and applications of Bayes' theorem. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So Bayes' theorem. Oftentimes I want to know the probability of some event A and then I want to update this likelihood after I re receive more information. Say that another event B happened or is true. So an example of this is the Monty Hall problem, right? I start by picking a door, and that door had a probability of one third of having a goat behind it. And then I get new privileged information that the goat is not behind this door where I know Monty will only tell me where the prize is not. He'll never tell me where the prize is. So a natural question is, how should I go about updating likelihoods based on new information? The answer to this is Bayes' theorem, and this theorem is at the heart of an entire branch of statistics, so it is very, very important in practice. So suppose that the probability that A happening is non-zero, and also suppose that the probability that B happens is also non-zero. In this case, it follows that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A, all divided by the probability of B. So how would I go about proving this theorem? Well, by definition, uh, the probability of A given B is the probability of A intersect B all divided by the probability of A, and the probability of B given A is the probability of A intersect B all divided by A. This is just by the definition of conditional probability. So what I can do is I could take the second equation and I could solve it for the probability of A intersect B. So by doing this, I get the probability of A intersect B is equal to this product. And now I can simply take this and plug it into this equation here. And if I do that, I get the probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection divided by B, which is equal to, do this replacement here, this statement here, which is exactly what Bayes' theorem stated. So now I've just given you a new theorem and I told you that it somehow lets me take the likelihood that some event A happened and then given this new information computes the likelihood that A still happens after this new information. Uh, how exactly does this work? Well, let's give a kind of concrete example instead of talking about these vague A and Bs and see how this would work in practical real world cases. At any given point in time, there's say a probability that I have cancer. Uh, and now I might suspect that I have cancer, so I go to get a cancer test to see if it's positive or negative. Well, after getting, say, a positive test back, I might want to know what is the probability that I actually have cancer given that the test was positive. So here if A is the statement I have cancer and B is the statement I took a uh, test for cancer and it came back positive, the probability of A given B is the probability that I actually have cancer given that I had a positive test. Well, how would I go about computing that? Well, I would first could say compute what's the probability that I have cancer before I have a test. Say if I have a family history or if I've been having symptoms that are consistent with cancer, that might, that might increase this probability. But say if I have no symptoms of cancer or no family history, that would lower this probability. And to this probability, I then want to scale it by this factor here divided by this factor here. So what are these two terms? This bottom one is the probability that a test for cancer is positive. So to know this, I need to know the positivity rate for cancer test within whatever region I'm considering. And that's data that I can physically look up. The next thing I need to look, know is what is the probability that the test is positive given that I have cancer? Well, that's known as the true positive or the specificity of the test. And again, this information is readily known via various studies. So now that I've gone to the doctor and say, uh, I have absolutely no uh, symptoms of cancer, my things aren't really consistent for it at all, but for some reason the doctor goes like, Let, yeah, let's just do a screening for all of these possible things and see like, hey, do you have cancer? Uh, so they do a cancer test that has some set properties, PB of B given A and PR of B. And now let's say, for instance, my test comes back positive. 
I could be immediately shocked at a positive test for cancer. But in fact, I really need to do this weighing here to see like what's the true probability that I have cancer given that this test is positive. And depending on the relative values of these numbers, that could be big or small. So this is the idea of how you use Bayes' theorem in practice, uh, given some preconceived idea that I have or some probability that I have for a particular idea being true, uh, and given new information that came in, say B, I can update the probability that A is true, in particular the probability that A is true given that B happened, via this formula here. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of applying Bayes' theorem. We're going to start with uh, kind of contrived examples where you don't necessarily need Bayes' theorem. And as we go further into higher numbered examples, we will get to cases where you do need Bayes' We'll get to cases where Bayes' theorem makes things a bit more convenient. And then finally, the cases where you actually do need to use Bayes' theorem. Okay, so example. Suppose I again have a standard deck of 52 cards. What is the probability that the first card we draw is not a face card, given that the second card is a face card? So previously I examined this problem, but I swapped the ordering of A given B. Uh, so I considered B given A using the nomenclature from the last lecture. So let's look at the solution for this. Let A be the event that the first card is not a face card, and let B be the event that the second card is a face card. So I now want to compute the probability of A given B. Previously, I computed the probability of B given A via basically brute force, uh, but now if I want to swap these, I could either go through and say compute the probability of A intersect B and divide this whole thing by the probability of A, which is doable, or instead I could use Bayes' theorem and say this probability of A given B is now this term here. So to be explicit on that first event, because that's something I probably should write down, I could have, instead of examining this, I could have instead computed the probability of A intersect B and divided this whole thing by the probability of B. And for this problem, these things here are readily computable, so that's not insanely hard to do. Okay, so let's go about doing this via Bayes' theorem. So in the last lecture, I computed that the probability of A was 42 over 50. I computed the probability of B was 12 over 52. And I computed the probability of B given A was 12 over 51. And out of all of these various probabilities, the most involved one was actually computing this term here. So just kind of keep that in mind. So now I can use Bayes' theorem. So the probability of A given B is simply this thing here, again, right? Now I can just plug all these terms in. So this is simply going to be 40 over 52 for probability of A. It's going to be this term here uh, for the probability of B given A, and the probability of B goes here. I do some simplification, and this is now 40 divided by 51. So again, computing this directly using the formula for conditional probability, of course, results in the same solution. So just to check this, the probability of A and B I computed previously, and that term was exactly 40 times 12, all divided by 52 times 51. And now the probability of B I know from here. So if I take this and divide it by this, the 52s would cancel and the 12s would cancel, leaving the same result. So in this case, Bayes' theorem doesn't actually help me simplify any of the computations. I still have to do all the hard computations here, but it is another alternative way to approach this problem. Uh, and generally speaking, when you work with these kind of contrived examples where everything is readily computable, uh, Bayes' theorem isn't necessarily a technique that will make your life easier for that problem, but sometimes it can if one of these particular conditional probabilities is particularly hard to compute. Speaking of maybe being potentially hard to compute, Monty Hall problem. So recall this from the previous lecture. Uh, again, just TLDR, we have three doors, if you will. Behind one of these doors is a prize, behind the other two are goats and I want to get the prize, I pick one. Monty then reveals one curtain that I didn't pick that has a goat behind it and gives me the opportunity to switch. Uh, the question is, is the probability better to switch? 
Well, we're now going to solve this using Bayes' theorem. So assume without loss of generality that I'm going to pick the first curtain. It doesn't matter which curtain I pick, everything's uniform, so I can freely do this. So denote the event that the prize is behind curtain one by P1, and denote the event that after we pick curtain one, Monty opens curtain two by R2. So now the probability that we win if we stay is going to be the probability that prize is behind curtain one, the one we picked, given that Monty tells us that there's a goat behind R2. So from Bayes' theorem, this is simply the probability of P1 times the probability of R2 given P1, all divided by the probability of R2. So now we need to compute the various terms in this equation, and once we have that, we'll have this conditional probability here. Once we have this probability, what are we going to do with it? Well, there's only two doors, right? So if this resulting probability here is less than one half, then it's better to switch. If it's exactly equal to one half, then it doesn't matter whether we switch or not. And if it's greater than one half, then we better stay because switching would lower our probability. Okay, so let's go into computing these various bits. So the probability of P1 is pretty easy to pick. Since there's three curtains to pick and only one prize and everything's uniformly distributed, the probability of P1 will simply be one third. Now I wanna compute the probability that Monty reveals R2 given that the prize is behind curtain one. So to do this, as first assume that P1 happened. So now that P1 is true, what's the probability that he reveals that it's behind curtain number two? Well, if I draw a picture for this, I have my prize is over here in one, and I have two options where I have a beautiful little goat named Henry and Chavez this time. So since there's a goat in each one of these and Monty presumably picks the thing at random, uh, this would give me that the probability of R2 given P1 would simply be one half. There's one way to pick one of these out of two. So explicitly the prize is not behind two or three these both are goats. That means the probability that he picks R2 is simply going to be a half because he could pick this one or he could pick this one. Okay, so finally I need to compute the probability that he picks R2 given no other extra information. So again, finally I want to compute this and to compute this we need to ask which one of these curtains will Monty open. So let's draw the curtains on here again. Curtain one, curtain two, and curtain three. So I know that I picked curtain one, right? So that means that Monty can't open curtain one. So this is no longer a possibility since it's the curtain that I picked. And thus either two or three will be opened. So now how does this help me compute the likelihood that the second curtain will be opened? Well, there's two curtains here, right? Two and three. And each one of these curtains is equally likely to have a goat or equivalently to have the prize behind it. Thus, these two curtains here, two and three, will be equally likely to be revealed. So the probability of R2 is equal to one half. Your text gives a different argument for uh, running this out that's equally valid. And in general, the technique in the book will work in more cases. But for this problem, I've always preferred this explanation as opposed to the one in the book. So you can take a look there. Uh, I do cover that in detail in a couple slides for now, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so now that I've computed all of these probabilities, what I have to do left is to take these different numbers here and plug them into here to see if the probability is greater than or equal to half or less than or equal to one half. Uh, so from here, thus, Plugging these in gives this expression here, which is just one third. From here, it's thus better to switch since the complement of one third is larger than one third, right? Two thirds a bigger probability. So if I switch, I have a two thirds chance of getting it. Whereas if I stay, I only have a one thirds chance of getting the prize. And again, just to emphasize it, the only reason why it's better to switch in this case is because I know that Monty can't open curtains that I don't pick, and Monty will only reveal curtains that have a goat.
if Monty picked a random one and it just so happened to be a goat, that would not actually change the probability. But here, since we have these particular rules, the probability density function changes from a uniform density function with one third, one third, one third to a non-uniform probability distribution function. So keep that in mind on, say, homework. Okay, let's look at one more example. So suppose I have two coins. One of these coins is fair, and the other one always comes up heads. If I pick one of these two coins at random and toss it three times, and it happened to be the case that it heads came up all three of those times, I might want to know what is the probability that we happen to pick the coin that always comes up heads. So solution, this is a classical problem to solve using Bayes' theorem. Without Bayes' theorem, there's not really a nice way to go about tackling this. Okay, so how am I going to go about tackling this? Well, first, let's introduce some variables. Let A be the event that we picked the biased coin, and let B be the event that three heads came up in a row. So we want to know what is the probability of A given B. So in words, this is the probability that we picked the biased coin, given that we flipped it and three heads came up in a row. So again, we could try to compute this directly, or instead we could use Bayes' theorem. So here we are going to use Bayes' theorem. So to compute Bayes' theorem, I need three things, right? I need to compute the probability of A. I need to compute the probability of B. And I need to compute the probability of B given A. Not necessarily in this order. Okay, so let's go about doing this. The probability of A is simply one half, right? We have two coins to pick from, and if we pick one at random, we have a one in two chance of picking the biased coin. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Now, what about the probability of B given A? What is the probability that three heads come up if I picked the biased coin? Well, the biased coin always displays heads, so the probability that three heads came up is going to be equal to one. So again, this is since this is the only event that could happen if we picked the bias coin, right? We always get heads. So now I need to compute this probability of B. So here's where I'm going to use a strand standard trick. This is the trick that was done in the book for the Monty Hall problem. And I've previously used this trick in the last lecture. So what's my trick going to be? Well, the probability of B is the same thing as the probability of B intersect A, union with the probability of B intersect a complement. Now these two events are mutually exclusive, so I can use axiom 3 to write this probability as the probability of this intersection plus the probability of that intersection. Generally speaking, this is a lot easier to compute than that. Okay, so here I can do one other step. What is the probability of a intersect b? Well, using the definition of conditional probability, I know that the probability of, say, B given A, this thing is going to be equal to the probability of B intersect A all divided by the probability of A. So if I scale this around and multiply through by the probability of A to pull this on the other side, uh, the probability of B intersect A is the product of these two things. But, nicely, I've computed the probability of A here, right? And I have also computed this probability of B intersect A over here. So by noticing this, I can use a trick. So the probability of B intersect A, that's simply probability of A times the probability of B given A. So the expression from here. And similarly, the probability of B intersect A complement, that's simply the probability of A complement times the probability of B given A complement. And some of these terms I already have, and the other ones I can compute pretty readily. So from here, the probability of A, well, I computed that, that's one half. The probability of B given A, well, I computed that, that's one. The probability of A complement, well, that's one minus the probability of A. So that's simply going to be one half here. So formally, this is coming from one minus a half. And now the probability of B given A complement. Well, if I pick the fair coin, so A complement would be picking the fair coin, 
What is the probability that I get three heads in a row? Well, this is a fair coin, so all I have to do is count the number of ways I can get three heads in a row and divide that by the total number of possible results of flipping the coin three times. Well, it's clear that there's only one way to get three heads in a row, so I'm going to have a one here. But there's two to the third possible flips, so I'm going to get this two thirds here. Okay, so cleaning that off there so you can still see. So from here, I can simply compute this thing and I get nine divided by 16. So this is the probability that B occurs. So now I can use Bayes' theorem by putting all of this together from here. The probability of A given B, well, that's simply going to be the probability of A, so 1 half, times the probability of B given A, so 1, all divided by the probability of B, which is going to be this 9 divided by 16. Okay, so here's an example where Bayes' theorem makes my life a little bit easier. Now, before I go on to the next example, let's revisit Bayes' theorem a bit. So for any arbitrary event B, that process that I did on this previous slide here, where I rewrote the probability of B as the probability of this, use the fact that those are mutually exclusive to rewrite it as the sum, and then use the definition of conditional probability to rewrite it like this, that holds in general given that the probability of A and B are non-zero. So for any event B that has non-zero probability, I probably should have added that in, uh, we have that the probability of B is going to be exactly equal to this statement here. This lets me rewrite Bayes' theorem in a different form, and in practice, this is the form of Bayes' theorem that you'll use for most problems, but not necessarily all problems. Suppose that the probability of A is non-zero and the probability of B is non-zero, then the probability of A given B is equal to the same thing we had here in the numerator, but in the denominator, I can replace B with this. And again, I can do this replacement since these probability here's are since these probabilities here are non-zero. So again, in many real-world problems, this is the form of Bayes' theorem that's going to be used, since these terms here are much easier to compute than the probability of B on its own. So let's look at a real-world problem, and we'll look at a few different versions of this example. Okay, assume that the nasopharyngeal swab COVID test, so that's the one where they take the uh, swab and stick it through your nose all the way to the back of your throat, has a sensitivity of 63% and, and a specificity of 99%. So I'll explain what these mean in when I actually go to solve the problem, uh, but just for now, those are technical terms that you use for tests. I could ask, what is the probability that you have COVID given that you have symptoms and have a positive test? So briefly, what is the sensitivity of a test? This is the probability that your test is positive given that you actually have the disease. And what's the specificity? Well, this is the probability that the test comes out negative given that you do not have COVID. And these are terms that are used for basically all tests of all types of diseases. So sensitivity and specificity exist for, say, test for cancer, just as another example. Okay, so how would I go about tackling this problem? Well, this is a Bayes' theorem problem. So let's jump right on in. Let A be the event that you are COVID positive, and let B be the event that your test was positive. We want to know what is the probability that we actually have COVID given that we have had a positive test. So via Bayes' theorem, this would be simply this expression here. So now I need to compute all of this information, but luckily a lot of this stuff was given to me. And unfortunately, some of this information, say the probability of A before I have the test, so the probability that I'm COVID positive before I've actually taken the test, isn't known and can't really be known. I have to guess for what this is based off the best data that I can collect. Okay, so the sensitivity of a test is simply the probability that the test is positive given that I have it. Therefore, the sensitivity tells me this expression here and this expression here. The other expression I need to know that the, I can get from the test is this term here. So it turns out that the specificity of a test is simply one minus this probability. So here using this data, I know that the probability of B given A is 0.63 and the probability of B given not A is 0 0.01. 
So these expressions here are properties of the test, and these are valid for all individuals. So now, me as an individual, I have some probabilities of having COVID. So in this example, I have symptoms. In real life, I do not. So I need to try to quantify what the probability that I have COVID given my current health state. So explicitly, we need to know what our prior belief about our likelihood of having COVID is. So we can say, since we have symptoms, let's just suppose it's 80%. It's something that's not fully knowable, but given that I have symptoms, I'm probably more likely than not to potentially have COVID. So again, this is subjective. And in practice, the way that you would compute this probability is by looking at a given individual's health history, whether they're vaccinated, all of that good stuff. So now I can take all these numbers and plug them in, and thus the probability of A given B would be this expression here, which turns out to be 99.6%. So in practice, what does this tell me? Well, for the current tests, uh, assuming that these numbers are still valid, and assuming that uh, being symptomatic gives you an 80% chance of having COVID, then if I get a positive COVID test, my probability of having COVID is really, really high. I mean, there's a 4 in 1,000 chance that it's false with these numbers as given, but that states that the COVID tests are very good tests. And it is also strong evidence that people who have symptoms and have a positive test should be self-isolating, and that's exactly what Canada does. Let's look at another case. What if I have no symptoms slash contact with anyone positive and test positive? Or if I want to go even further, uh, I live alone and I only go out to uh, get groceries and I do the contactless pickup. So I have very, very low chance of getting COVID, but I still took a test and it was positive. What would the probability that I actually have COVID given this positive test be? Okay, so again, we now want to compute the probability that we have COVID despite the lack of symptoms and given that we have a positive test. So again, this is still going to be the exact same expression that I had before. The only thing that changes between this example and the previous one is what the probability of A is. So here, but our prior assumptions about the likelihood of having COVID are now going to be lower because we don't have symptoms. So seemingly, I could be an asymptomatic case, but my probability of having COVID is probably lower. So let's just assume for giggles that the probability of A is 0 0.1. So from here, if I plug all these numbers in, I thus have the probability that I'm positive given that I have a positive case is now 87.5%. So, so far the COVID test gives really good results and in general it actually does give really good results, but let's look at another case. What about the probability that we don't have COVID given a negative test and no symptoms? So in this case, I don't have any symptoms. I have a low probability of having COVID. Uh, nevertheless, I decided to take a test just to be safe. Uh, what is the probability that I don't have COVID given this false test. Well, I want to know the probability that I don't have COVID, so A complement, given that I have a negative test, so B complement. So this, just plugging it into Bayes' formula, gives me this expression here. So now I need to compute these quantities here, and luckily these are known from the test. And the next thing I need to quantify is what the probability of A complement is in A, and I'm going to use the same numbers that I used before. Okay, so since we have no symptoms, let's just assume that the probability of having COVID is 10%, and this tells me that the probability of COVID complement is 0.9. So now, from the test data, I know that this probability is 0.99, and this probability is 0.37. So to be explicit, this is the probability that I have a negative test given that I don't have COVID. That's what the specificity is. And this is the probability that I have a negative test given that I have COVID. This is a false negative, which is bad, uh, and that is 37%. So now putting all this together, the probability is going to be this statement here, which is simply this when I plug the numbers in, or 97%. 
So if I'm asymptomatic, have no symptoms, have no contact with anyone, and I get a negative COVID test, that gives me a 97% chance that I don't have COVID, given that I've picked this number here as my quantification of the probability of having COVID, given that you have no symptoms. So again, subjective, so ultimately subjective, but more accurate number here. So very good so far. It's very good at telling if you have COVID, whether or not you have symptoms. And and it's very accurate at telling you that you don't have COVID given that you a priori don't have a high probability of getting COVID. Let's test one final scenario. So now, what is the prob so now what about the probability that we don't have COVID given a negative COVID set test and we have symptoms? Well, I want to know the probability that we don't have COVID given a negative COVID test by Bayes' theorem that's given by this expression here. And since we're symptomatic, let's just assume that the probability of COVID is 90%. So if I just plug these numbers in, the probability would be this statement here, or this, or 23% chance. So here, the probability that we don't have COVID, given that we've had this negative COVID test, is 23%. So this can be a problem, right? this doesn't really rule out the possibility that I don't have COVID, right? It's a 23% chance of not having COVID, which gives me a 77% chance of still having COVID. So a negative test for individuals who have COVID symptoms isn't really sufficient to throw out the possibility that they have COVID. So again, this can be a problem since we can't really rule out having COVID depending on what likelihood what the likelihood that we are willing to accept is. So in this scenario, my personal opinion of what you probably should do would just be to take another COVID test and apply this method again, and that will give you a better picture of whether or not you have COVID. I don't know what the official stance is, but yeah. Okay, so here I have a link to a recent paper where they do this argument using odds, and they give a few handy-dandy little plots, things like that. It's beyond the scope of the class, but that's where I got these numbers from. Uh, so depending on how accurate that paper is, uh, the numbers that we used here may be more or less accurate. But in general, the thing that you should get out of this process is for any medical test you ever have in your life, ever, a positive slash negative test doesn't guarantee that you're actually positive or negative. It just simply gives you a higher probability that you are positive or negative. And back behind the lines, that's basically what we pay doctors to do is given your particular status and this test coming out in this way, how do you interpret that test? Okay, so let's go to our assigned reading. So I want you to read pages 86 through 89, and we have a mean. So when Bay gives you a theorem, Bay's theorem, and we have an Elon Musk tweet, something extremely bogus going on, tested for COVID four times, two were negative, two were positive, same machine, same test, same nurse, rapid antigen test from BD. Well, this really isn't anything bogus going on. Uh, for any given medical test, there's a probability that you could be in the situation where two are positive, two are negative, but by taking these four tests and getting those results, you could use Bayes' theorem to better compute what the actual likelihood you had COVID is, and this really just goes to show that Musk, at least within this context, doesn't understand Bayes' theorem, nor how to apply it to medical tests in general. So yeah, a positive test just means an increased likelihood that you are positive, and a negative test just means an increased likelihood that you are negative. And given that the test is a good test and has a high specificity and sensitivity, then that test helps you better understand your current medical situation. So yeah, that's our lecture for the day. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.